In Sydney in the 1980s, a Christian rock band was breaking down barriers in opposition to the gospel by creating music with a message, and it was relevant to their generation. They also gave Christian youth and young adults an example of creativity, excellence, and an uncompromising Christianity that they could follow. The band was known as In The Silence, and they were leaders in their generation. Well, fast forward, and the singer-songwriter of this band developed his leadership gift, gaining an honours degree in theology and a PhD in ancient history. Professor John Dixon is now an author, speaker, historian, and media commentator. And these days, he's based in Wheaton College in Illinois in the US, and he's published over 20 books. For his latest project, he's launched Undeceptions, an organization and podcast seeking to promote thoughtful Christianity in doubting times. Well, it is our great pleasure to welcome Professor John Dixon to 2020 today. John, welcome. Mate, you have to call me John. I I can't stand the professor thing. My, My students call me professor and I can't make any of them call me John. So please, talking to an Aussie. Call me John. Uh, okay, <laughs> John. Okay, John. You got me. Okay, we'll go Aussie for you, just just for you. Okay, so uh, John, welcome. Thanks, mate. <laughs> Well, John, uh, I really enjoyed reading out that introduction because I was, and I'm going to really indulge our Sydney listeners now, I was one of those kids down on the Manly course, so at a place called Humpty's at the back of St. Matthew's Anglican Church in Manly, Sydney, back in the good old days, and there was this band there, and you know, I was a new Christian, and my friends and I kind of thought Christians were fairly uncool, and there was a band there that really grabbed our attention and sort of said to us, wow, not all Christians are nerds. And uh, <laughs> and you just happened to be the lead singer of that band, and it was called In the Silence. They were good days. Oh, mate, I, I have such fond memories of those days. Um, in some ways, I'm embarrassed because we were like, if you threw In Excess, Big Country, and you 2 together and then took out about 60% of the talent, that's what our band <laughs> sounded like. <laughs> um but it it was an amazing time playing music with my best friends, all of whom had just become Christians, um, trying to promote Christ around the world was just a joy. And, you know, honestly, I still meet people. What is it? 40 years later? Let's not count, John. Let's not count. Maybe not. Maybe not 40. <laughs> Let's just say 30-ish years yeah, later. 20-something. 20 20-something, 20 I want to say. Who, um, who'd who become Christians through one of the In the Silence concerts and are still, you know, faithful to the Lord. I've met several who have become pastors. So I look back on those days as very special. And, you know, sometimes I think... It was the best work I'd ever done. Like, it's all downhill from there. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I was going to ask you that, because do you sometimes wonder what would have happened if you just kept going? Because obviously you two started out, and I don't want to draw comparisons, um, but you two did start out as a bunch of young Christian dudes just playing music and singing, and they were passionate, and they carried on with it, and and you obviously went down a different path. But do you sometimes wonder what would have happened if you'd stayed at it? Uh, I do. Um, We... We made a deliberate decision to to end it um, because it, it, what not many people know, <clears throat> um, those who even know of In the Silence, not even many people know, that um, just before we made the decision to disband, we'd been offered a five-album contract with a big American uh, record company. And it required moving to the States and spending six months of our year just playing Christian gigs in churches and stadiums and like the Christian music circuit. And we really wanted to do it. And we thought, oh, that'd be great, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> but our manager, Dougal McKenzie, um, said to us, guys, from the beginning, you said, you want to be playing to people who aren't Christians, not just going to the Christian circuit, but giving your lives to just reaching the, the skeptic, 
which is mostly what we've been doing in pubs and clubs and schools and prisons. And it really challenged us. And in the end, we, we, we got to the point where we thought either we take this deal, move to the US, do the whole Christian music industry thing, and let go of our um, evangelistic ambitions, or we disband. It came down to that choice. And we disbanded and decided in that moment we should get the best theological education that we could, that we would study in order to become able to reach a, a secular Australia. So I do wonder, <clears throat> but not in a kind of um, regret way, only in a kind of, wow, would have been amazing to see what had happened had we moved to America. But I'm, I'm certain we chose the right path, got the theological edu education that we needed, got the, you know, in my case, history training that I needed, to then do all the other things. Um, cause, cause one thing's for sure, I wouldn't still be singing in a band now. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so the, the door that that opened up is uh, much bigger and better sure. than the door had we just moved to the States. Well, you know, never say never, John, because Elton John kept singing till a very late age, but I will say this, you probably wouldn't look as good in your t-shirt today. <laughs> as you did in those early days, because there was an ad on Anglican television, and it was so cool. Do you remember that ad? You guys were in an Anglican church playing your music, and this young girl obviously wasn't saved, and she walked to the front, and and, oh, yeah. there, and there's this young, funky John Dixon in his T-shirt. I was watching it on YouTube yesterday, okay? My memory's not this good. And, uh, you know, and you're singing there, and she comes forward, and it was just, it was so cutting edge. It, it was amazing. And um, But, yeah, what an amazing transition. And I am going to indulge our Sydney listeners because uh, we've just got a new digital signal into Sydney and Melbourne as of January 1st this year. So Vision Radio now broadcasts across Sydney and Melbourne to anyone who has a digital radio in their car yeah. or at home or through their computer, as well as our Vision Christian Media app. But you're a Sydney boy, John. Where did you grow up in Sydney? What was your background there? Uh, I grew up in Mossman. Um, I know when you say Mossman nowadays, it sounds like you're very posh, born with a silver spoon in your mouth. Um, <clears throat> we weren't. <laughs> Mossman, once upon a time, was not as rich as it is now. And uh, I lost my dad when I was nine. So I was raised by a single mum who, who raised three boys. And luckily, they had pay paid off the house. But... Um, we didn't get, you know, fancy holidays or we didn't get, you know, fancy clothes or anything. But we grew up in one of the most beautiful parts of Australia, like right near Balmoral Beach in Mossman. And my mates and I, we just went to Mossman High School uh, and it was at Mossman High School that we became Christians altogether. And my best mates and I, um, at high school started this crazy band. We'd never heard of Christian music, but we wanted to share the faith that we'd come uh, to believe uh, when we were 16. And we just thought, well, let's start a band. We had no idea that there was such a thing as Christian music. <laughs> we just thought we'd invented the genre. <laughs> um, um, and we just started playing pubs. So we were in our HSC year. Two of us were too young to even play in pubs. Uh, but we were playing pubs and clubs and, you know, eventually a year after high school became a full-time thing. So that's my background. Um, you know, Sydney boy, raised by the beach, loved it, got to play music with my best mates. But in the end, we, we just felt we were going to be shallow, maybe impressive, but shallow if we didn't do theological education and I went to Moore College in Sydney, which is renowned as the nerdiest theological college in the country. Um, and we actually asked people around the country before we went into, into college, we asked people, what would be, if we're going to go to theological college, what would be the nerdiest, most serious one? And everyone said, Moore College, Moore College, Moore College. Yeah. So anyway, we just dutifully went into Moore College. Um, and I, I tell you, I found it really hard. Um because I'd, I'd gone from touring the world with my best mates playing music to learning ancient Greek. <laughs> and, you know, the first year or so, I nearly left because I just wanted to get back out on the road and so on. And I'm really thankful that a couple of the 
lecturers there um, took me under their wing, pushed me and said, look, in these few years you're at college, you're going to learn stuff you are never going to learn again. So if you want this long term ministry, you know, that, that is intellectually robust, that is practical and so on, you have to give yourself to these three years. So eventually I did. And I did, you know, I did pretty well and went on to, you know, academics after that. Yeah, it's uh, it's quite a, I guess, a journey into humility. And uh, it kind of reminds me, I'm not comparing you to Billy Graham, but I know when Billy Graham was young, he also went to, you know, Bible college and he really struggled because I think he'd been out, you know, preaching on the streets and evangelizing okay. and for him to actually go into the rigors of academic study and, and get that grounding uh, you know, it was difficult for him as well. And I can only imagine a couple of rock stars from Mossman. And by the way, I went to Bagala Boys High just down the road from you guys. and uh, Bally Boys. Bally Boys. And we used to come and play chess. Well, I used to come and play chess and uh, debate against Mossman High. And for us, going to Mossman was like going to the rich part of Sydney because we were definitely from the ghetto in those days. You can remember Manly in those days. It was rough uh, in the... You would talking- never have met me in the chess club or the debating club. <laughs> I, I was off playing soccer at Allen Border Oval. There you that go. Or, or surfing at Manly. Well, One of those two. I was also surfing, brother, but I was also getting out of school at every opportunity. So we were the worst <laughs> debating team. I don't think we ever won a debate. We would sit in the uh, in the library and throw spitballs at each other and just joke around, and then we'd get out and try and make it up on the spot. So no, we weren't we weren't your classic debaters. But uh, yeah, I do remember most of those days. But yeah, for you to go through that process, what a humble journey. But wow, what benefits, huh? All that study. And you're now a professor of history. And I do want to put it out there to our listeners. We're going to open up talkback lines in a few minutes. And when we do, you might have a, a question for, he doesn't like being called Professor John, but John is a professor of ancient history. You might have a question about the Bible, about the Dead Sea Scrolls, or just something that's been niggling you uh, about history or the Bible. And, and John's here to answer those questions. But John, you've written 20 books. And two of your books have actually become television documentaries. And a third, uh, it's called For the Love of God, How the Church is Better and Worse Than You Ever Imagined. It was released in Australian cinemas in June 2018. This is amazing. How do books become television documentaries? Uh, People who make documentaries read the book and go, oh, this might make a good documentary. Really as simple as that. So my first two documentaries, The Christ Files and The Life of Jesus, were... um, just grew out of the books that I'd written. And then the third one was a little more organized um, uh, because I worked for the Center for Public Christianity. You know, this was long after the band, long after theological and history studies. Um, I I started the Center for Public Christianity in Sydney, which is still going gangbusters. Um, But I was there from its inception in 2007 till 2018. And um, we, we, we were aware that a common criticism of the faith was that Christians have basically damaged the world. You know, it's all inquisitions, crusades, you know, raping and pillaging through history. And we thought, look, we need to make a documentary that admits the bad things Christians have done and then points out the incredible things that the teachings of Jesus and the Christian church have given to culture. So both at the same time. So that one is a little more deliberate and we're really pleased with that. And now I'm making a fourth documentary, which is taking the oldest Christian hymn ever discovered. It's 1800 years old. It's from the 200s AD. And it has not only the ancient Greek words, which we can easily translate, it also has the melody, the actual melody, the ancient Greek melody. So I could sing it to you, you know, I'm not going to, but... Well, hang on, let's um, stop there. How can you read music from ancient Greece? Like, how does that happen? Like, were they writing chords that we could recognize? Yeah, it's not chords, it's just notes. So they had a notation system uh, that we've long lost, and then we invented our own modern notation system. But they had their own notation system. And we have a couple of hundred examples of songs from ancient Greece Um, But this is the only Christian example that we have, and it uses normal pagan, you know, pagan Greek notes, um, but a Christian uh, song praising the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, the only giver of all good gifts. So here's, here's a cool thing. I get to combine all of my loves, my musical love and my history love, 
because we're filming a documentary not only about the discovery of this tiny piece of paper with the hymn on it, it was found in Egypt, um, in the in a rubbish dump in Egypt. How long ago was that? When was it found? It was found in the 1890s, but it sat in an Oxford library in a, in a vault, in a, in a climate-controlled vault in Oxford for all these, you know, 100-plus 100, 100 years. And I was studying it for some history stuff I was doing, and I suddenly had this thought, why don't we bring this back to life and give it back to the church? So we are filming the discovery of it. We've gone to Egypt and filmed that the actual manuscript itself in Oxford. But here's the coolest thing, mate. We have engaged two of the top Christian songwriters in the world to take this ancient melody and this, these ancient words, which I've translated into English and bring it back to life in a modern praise song that the church can sing again. So we are giving back to the church a song that this church hasn't sung for nearly 1800 years. And you know who the two songwriters are? Our own Australian Ben Fielding, the songwriter who gave us the Creed and a bunch of other things, but also America's Chris Tomlin, Amazing. who's written so many hits. And they have both collaborated to rework the song. And I've now heard the song and we've filmed the songwriting, we filmed the recording, and eventually we're going to have a documentary that releases this song back to the world. I'm sorry to go off on a tangent, but you can see I'm, I'm a little bit excited about well, it. Well, I'm excited about it too. So when will the song be ready in English for us all to sing? Is it ready yet? Is it almost ready? Um, it's pretty much ready. We're adding an Egyptian backing singer in April. So she's coming to Nashville. We're all going to Nashville. We're filming her recording the backing vocals. So we just thought it'd be great to have an Egyptian. Oh, yeah. Because this ancient document was found in Egypt. Yeah, yeah. So let's... Let's get an Egyptian to sing it. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. And then and then we're gonna we've got to film a live performance of it to sort of complete the documentary. And I know it seems ridiculous, but it's gonna take one more year. We hope to we hope to release the song and the documentary in about February, March twenty five. Yeah. So about a year from now. Yeah. Um, and the song itself will appear on Chris Tomlin's next album. That is amazing. It's a great story. And I love how you said that it used pub greek just the the working people's greek uh yeah. for the song and it just shows that not much is changing the church has it just like in the silence came along and we're playing in pubs trying to reach non-christians obviously the writers of that hymn that song were just normal people probably been saved a year or two and said well how can we worship god in a way that the people around us understand isn't that amazing it is absolutely right that's exactly what they're doing because they they could have tried to make it a little more holy you know, the tune a little more holy, <laughs> but instead they've used they've used the style of music that we know was played at the local Greek pub, uh, or at, or in the theatre at a local pagan festival. Same style of music. Um, yeah, I love it. I, I love that idea, and we're still doing it, right? Yeah, and I love the Egyptian singer. So, is she based in Egypt? She's obviously a, a Egyptian Coptic Christian. Is she based in She's Egypt? An Egyptian now? Coptic Christian. Yeah, Egyptian Coptic, Coptic Christian. Coptic Christian. She's. Um, she does choirs. She does some tr lots of tr traditional stuff. She doesn't do any modern stuff. So this is going to be interesting. Yeah. Uh, but we're going to interview her for the documentary about, you know, the Coptic church, which is such an ancient church. Yeah. Um, I might get her to sing a, a few Coptic songs yeah. for us for the documentary. And then I'm going to teach her the song and she's going to go into the studio and, um, and, and do the backing vocals. And we've, we've been able to keep some of the ancient tune. Most of the ancient tune's a little bit weird, so you couldn't just re replicate it, because yeah. Chris Tomlin and Ben Fielding have written, honestly, mate, a cracking uh, praise and worship song. I can't wait for the church to have it. But through the middle of it are these ancient melodic lines, um, and this Coptic singer is going to kind of replicate that. Well, John, I'm get I'm not a muso, but I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about this. That's gonna be <laughs> that's gonna be amazing. It's actually gonna be yeah. an amazing event. So it's February next year. Really look forward to that. We're gonna have to interview you just before that as well, and uh, and Please. get the latest on it. But that is remarkable, and it's also just very encouraging, isn't it? That you find something from so long ago, which is actually still relevant to us today and that the church is still going through the same struggle today to to be relevant to our generation and and to reach the lost and not be out of touch. And yet keep the Christian faith the same Christian faith because the song is about the father 
the Son and the Holy Spirit, who is the only good, the only giver of all good gifts. That's the key line. Father, Son and Spirit, the only giver of all good gifts. Amazing. And, and obviously in today's world, and we'll get onto this later when we talk about your Undeceptions podcast, but in the modern world, some Christians are even going away from the whole Trinity teaching, aren't they, and trying to <laughs> challenge that. And to see, you know, the church, you know, eighteen hundred years ago, singing about the Trinity, singing about Father, Son, yep. Holy Spirit, so encouraging. And I just want to remind yep. our callers, we are going to open up talkback lines very shortly. And you might have a question for I'm um, John, Jono, mate. There's your Aussie, uh, you know, there's your Aussie greeting. But you are a professor. Professor John Dixon is with us today <laughs> on Twenty Twenty, and you might have a question about ancient history, about the Dead Sea Scrolls, as I said earlier, about something to do with the Bible that you would like to ask John. And John, you do have quite a name here. Even my program director here at uh, at Twenty Twenty today at um, Vision Radio, I should say, I told him I was interviewing you. He said, "Oh, John Dixon, I remember his books when I was uh, discipling new Christians back in the 90s and we used to use his books. So there are a lot of people out there that know your name, John, have possibly read your book. So if you've got a question that you want to ask John today, we have the one and only John Dixon on the line all the way from Illinois in the United States. So if you've got a question, feel free to give us a call. But John, just quickly, let's talk about this Undeceived podcast. Let's just premise this now. What is the Undeceived podcast? Yeah, so, I mean, it's a weird word, isn't it, undeceive? Um, But it's a word that's been in the English language since the 16th century, and it's a word that C.S. Lewis loved. And, um, in fact, there's a collection of his essays that's now out of print, and the title is Undeceptions. That's the title of the whole collection. And so I just, I've I've long loved C.S. Lewis, obviously, and I've long loved his project, of trying to undeceive people, that is, reveal the truth to people. And so when I thought, you know, I thought of establishing a podcast, actually I was convinced by a couple of others to do the podcast, um, that was the obvious name, Undeceptions. And so I've been doing it three years now, and I've been blown away. It, You know, it's been one of the most rewarding, successful things that I've ever done. I mean, way more people have listened to the podcast in just three years than in all my preaching um, in in the previous 20. So it's it's just a delight to be doing it. And it's a, basically a weekly podcast where we produce an audio documentary. So it's not really like a lot of other podcasts that are just two people talking, being interviewed or whatever. We produce more like a BBC documentary. So I do interview experts from around the world on history, philosophy, science, the arts, everything. And then I give that interview to my team in Sydney, um, and I have five staff for the Undeceptions podcast in Sydney, and they then take the interview and produce this incredible audio soundscape thing that integrates news clips from CNN, actors reading texts, uh, musical breaks, Like, I'm blown away by what they do, and really the talent, the key thing in the podcast is not me going and interviewing someone. It's it's what my team sort of storyboards together to produce this hour, hour and 15, sometimes an hour and 40 podcast on topics as wild and wonderful as, let me say, the Crusades, two-part episodes on the Crusades. Um... Science versus God, um, uh, Emperor Constantine, how did the Bible come together? I have an episode on American football yep. where I get to interview a couple of Green Bay Packers, yep. which is my team. Here. <laughs> uh, and, you know, like how, to, how do you remain a Christian and an NFL player? Yep. Yeah, so, so the diversity is massive, yep. but it's all about trying to undeceive people. And, John, we do have a caller who's joined us from Tasmania. If you remember about, do you remember Tasmania, John? You haven't forgotten about Tasmania, have you? I love Tasmania. In fact, it was one of the last places I visited before I came to Illinois. Well, I'll tell you, as a northerner who lives up in Queensland, um, Tasmania became a bit of a tourist place for us during COVID as well. It just, I went down there a couple of years ago. I thought, this place is amazing. Now, I've just got to get this caller down on to the line. So, But before we do that, John, just tell us more about the deceptions that, like, what do you think is one of the biggest deceptions that Christians in the modern church 
are facing today? Well, I mean, some of the, you know, universal questions haven't gone away. You know, questions like, is the Bible history, um, you know, where is God in our suffering and pain? Like, they're still there. They, they haven't gone away. But the, the, the kinds of questions that have emerged in recent years um, are really to do with, has Christianity damaged us? So it's less to do with intellectual questions, um, you know, how do we prove Jesus rose again, etc., and more to do with uh, whether the church has damaged history, whether Christianity is too, you know, mean, um, you know, whether its views on sex and sexuality are bigoted. So it's kind of like the ethical questions have really come to the fore in recent years, even though the other intellectual questions remain. Yep. I can see that, and obviously the internet's contributed to that as well, the amount of information out there in the internet. But our caller from Tasmania is Mike, and we've got him on the line now. Mike, have you got a question for John? Well, it's it's really a comment. I grew up in a church denomination that practiced, well, I would suggest non-biblical things. And uh, and it was, I know it was Jesus that saved me, but it was good theology that, that, that God used to save me. Like if, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. So, you know, uh, you know, it's good to, it's good sort of throw out, throw out, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, get rid of the bathwater and keep the baby. Yep. That's a really relevant comment there. Um, Mike, and obviously uh, what what he's saying there is that we just need to make sure we've got the truth, we've got good theology, good teaching as a foundation for our experience and and our faith in Jesus. Hey, Mike, I want to thank you so much for calling in today. John, just keep talking more about the the, the underceptions and the the things that you're finding out there in the the, the church world at the moment. Well, as I say, you know, the the kind of uh, problems people have with Christianity revolve around where the Christianity is dumb and mean, basically. And so um, I often feel like a big goal of the Underceptions podcast is to leave listeners thinking, oh, Christianity is not as dumb or as mean as I thought. And that's a huge win, in a, particularly in a really secularizing culture, because it allows people to think, oh, well, if, this, if it's not as dumb and mean as I thought, maybe I should look into it. And we have found a lot of people have. So we take topics like even the really controversial ones, like abortion or transgender. There are episodes on both of those. And what we what we do is we, we try and approach it in a really generous, thoughtful way and give the kind of secular view its strongest version, right? Its strongest critique of the classical traditional view of Christianity And once we've really given that a good go, we just try and develop an argument through an interview or, you know, through an editorial that points people to the fact that actually Christianity has answers to this. You may have only approached those topics in the culture wars where it's all just heat and hatred. But actually, Christianity has got some wise and generous things to say that are still absolutely traditional. Um, so this is sort of our goal is to surprise people, not by being like overly flexible or changing Christianity at all. We don't want to be so hip and cool that we're not left with Christianity anymore. Um, <clears throat> we want to present traditional Christianity in a way that is thoughtful and cheerful and surprises people. Um, and we've found that that this is indeed the case. Yeah, excellent. And just, okay, we've only got a minute till we go to news, but as an example, in the pro-life debate, what, in in a, in a in 30 or 40 seconds, what is your message in the pro-life debate, like you said, that sort of reaches non-Christians as opposed to alienates them? Well, you know, a lot of apology for Christians being jerks on the issue. I think, I think that's important. Um, but in the end, what, what I, what I, what I lay down to people is my own sort of journey on this, that I can't think of a single argument for abortion, uh, for ending the life of a baby in the womb that doesn't equally apply to ending the life of a newborn. If the mother wanted to, if the mother, you know, felt it was just going to 
uh, she couldn't afford the baby anymore and so on. We would never insist that she was allowed to end that life. Um, and I, and, and I, we try and tease out the logic of that in a compassionate way. There is no argument for abortion that doesn't actually also apply to an infant, yeah. killing an infant. So if you're not willing to do that, why? Why are we still standing for abortion? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Really, really well articulated as well. John, I want to go straight to a caller who's been waiting very, very patiently for us. And we have Sue from Carmine. Sue, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Andrew. And hello, John. And um, what an amazing journey you've had as a Christian. It's just been quite extraordinary. Um, I came to know salvation through Jesus when I was 41 years of age. And since becoming a very committed follower of Jesus and studying the scriptures intensely over many years now, or over 30 years, um, I find that where people say that Christianity has caused so much damage, and you've uh, referenced that several times in your talk, that it was actually the original Catholic Church that brought in a lot of false doctrine and dogma and paganistic practices and rituals and so on. And whether or not it's right to continue to say that Christianity has caused so much damage, because I I was given the truth through a Pentecostal church, and it was totally different to the Catholic upbringing I received. So I'd just like your comments on that. Well, Sue, lovely to hear from you, and uh, I'm just loving all these Aussie accents. I'm surrounded by American accents. So to hear Aussies is just uh, making me feel <laughs> homesick. And and how gorgeous to hear of um, your coming to faith uh, in your 40s. What a joy. So praise mm-hmm. God for that. Yeah, um, to, to the substance of what you say, um, the, the, there's, something, there's something true in what you say. Um, you know, it's true that... Um, the Inquisitions were Catholic Inquisitions. The Crusades were Catholic Crusades. But here are two things that give me pause um, about going too far down the line that you propose. One is we know that um, there was some very serious Christian bad behavior before the Roman Catholic Church had the power that it, you know, eventually had. So there were Christian riots in northern Egypt that resulted in the killing of a pagan philosopher uh, named Hypatia. And it was the Bible reader in church. His name was Peter, Peter the Reader. And he killed this poor woman um, in cold blood. And he did it he, he thought, as a Christian, he thought he was doing Christian stuff. And this is before we have popes and the Vatican and all of that. So that's one thought. The other is, at the other end, um, Martin Luther, uh, the great German reformer who, who, who recovered for us the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith, you know, the salvation that, that you mentioned, Sue, yeah. um, he, he was a wonderful theologian and blessed the church and, you know, is the reason for the Protestant Reformation. But mm. he also was incredibly anti-Semitic. And quite late in life, very mature Luther wrote the most scathing book, an entire book, advocating killing Jews, advocating mm. burning all of their books of the Talmud and Mishnah, Um, And even burning down synagogues. This is our great Mm. Martin Luther who advocated this. Mm. So this is what makes me think I can no longer just say it was the Catholics who who made everything go wrong. Because sadly, some of our heroes of the faith were very Mm. flawed individuals. And, um, you know, I'm sure God had mercy on Martin Luther um, but boy, oh boy, um, I think he's getting a talking to uh, on the judgment day, um, as indeed, as indeed, you know, 
maybe we all are because because the thing about studying history as i do is that actually i'm a little less judgmental of even luther and uh of the roman catholic church in the medieval period because you know what my main thought is my main thought is I wonder what my blind spots are. I wonder what people 300 years from now will say about John Dixon. And uh, that makes me a little more humble <laughs> than, than, than I was without that thought. Because if Martin Luther had a blind spot, I'm sure I've got some as well. Mm. Yes, but isn't it true to say that Martin Luther was a Catholic until he came up with the 95 Theses? and then challenged the church and ultimately left or was excommunicated. So he had a yes. Catholic foundation. Yeah, he, but he um, wrote his 95 theses in 1517, um, and so he broke away from the church shortly thereafter. The document that I'm referring to is from 1543. So it's when Martin Luther was the leader of the Protestant movement. He'd long left the Catholic church. And yet he wrote the most disgusting things about uh, about his Jewish neighbors. So, you know, Sue, I, I just think we're all a bit of a mess and Lord have mercy on us all, especially me. <laughs> you know, John, that is a very balanced and a very educated uh, response to Sue's question and, and, and really valid points there. Sue, I want to thank you so much for calling in today. We really appreciate your input on 2020. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. So nice to hear from you. Yeah, that was a really good answer, John. Well done. You, you sound like a professor of history. Hey, we, uh. <laughs> <laughs> we still have our talk lines open. If anyone else has a question for the professor, John Dixon, who's in the house today. And as I said earlier, John is based in Wheaton College. Now, I did my research on Wheaton College, and there's some been, there has been some fairly remarkable graduates from Wheaton College. I want to read out some of these graduates now. Billy Graham, the one and only. His wife, Ruth Bell Graham. John Piper. Gary Chapman, who wrote The Five Love Languages, the author of that book. These are all graduates of Wheaton College. So Wheaton College is not an insignificant institution, is it, um, for, for no, Christians who want amazing. to do further study? It's amazing. Um, and a name you didn't mention that's maybe not as well known, but Todd Beamer. Um, is a, re a relatively recent graduate. He, he's the guy in 9-11 who took the plane down. He's oh. the guy who said, let's roll. Really? They rang, you know, they were one of the hijacked planes. Yeah. And he, like others, prayed. And then he, the last thing he can be heard saying is, all right, we're going to take this down. Let's roll. He was a Wheaton student. Wow. Um, he was a and, rugby player, uh, wasn't he? That was a rugby player who... Was he that, that the guy who played rugby as well? <clears throat> Not sure if it was rugby or one of the other football codes, but the the big building where we have lunch is named the Beamer Centre in his honour. Wow, I didn't know that. That's an amazing story. So he was a very committed Christian who probably yeah. saved hundreds of lives, stopped that plane, because that was headed for the White House, wasn't it, that plane? Uh, yeah, or the Pentagon. Yeah, one of those. Yeah, one of those. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. So it's an amazing institution. Now, we've got another caller come through, John. And uh, who have we got on the line there? Someone, have you got a question for John? Yes, hello. Yeah, hi there. Hi, John. It's Lindy from Parks, New South Wales. How are you? <laughs> nice to chat. Parks. Woo! It's been a while since yeah. I've been out there. Uh, pretty warm and windy today. And tomorrow's going to be 41, so even warmer. <laughs> oh, boy. So probably not a good place to visit the next couple of days. <laughs> anyway, a quick question. Um, if it's about the Sabbath, if um, God made the Sabbath for man to rest since the beginning of time, like in creation, I took that as a Saturday. How does it become Sunday? Or when did that happen? Or what happened with that? Yeah, thank you. So... Um, Christians have different views on the Sabbath, and it's partly because Jesus said um, that the Sabbath was made for humans, not humans for the Sabbath. And yeah. also the Apostle Paul in Colossians says, let no one judge you on what you do on a Sabbath day. Okay, so Christians have flexibility as to 
you know, whether they keep a Sabbath or when they keep a Sabbath. But you asked a specific historical question. When did it become yeah. Sunday? Um, now, strictly speaking, well, Sabbath add, used to be... Why, actually? Why as well? Is yeah, that right? Sure. Why? Yeah. So, strictly speaking, Sabbath was Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. That's the Jewish yeah. timing. And our yeah. Jewish friends still keep that very strictly. Okay. Yeah. But in the Roman Empire, um, the Roman Emperor Constantine in yeah. the early 300s yeah. um, decided to give the whole empire a day off um, because, you know, most people who weren't elite, rich elites, pe elite people had to work every day, not just slaves, but if you're a woodworker, you worked every day. There was no such thing as a day off. I but think seven days a week. You worked seven days a week, unless oh, wow. you were a senator in which case you worked only about five days a year. Um, but leaving that aside, um, Emperor Constantine in the 320s AD um, decided, based on the Sabbath idea, that everyone should have a day off. And so he scratched his head and thought to himself, which day should it be? It could be the Saturday, but actually everyone meets for church on Sunday. So here's a fantastic idea. I'm going to give the empire a mandated day off that happens to coincide with the day everyone went to church because I hope people will use their time off to go to church. And so he made Sunday the day off. Now, we owe it to Constantine that we have this weekend, and it must have been a joyous day um, when, you know, workers actually realised that by law they could take a day off. And as I say, it was kind of cool that Constantine, the emperor, made it the day that people could also go to church. And uh, it's possible that this had an impact on more and more people going to church because prior to that, prior to the 320s AD, church was on a work day. Sunday was the first day of the week. Everyone was at work. So it was pretty hard to get to church. But after 320s, boom. So people went to church on the Sunday they did. Okay, but they could still keep the Sabbath holy, like the Fourth Commandment. Remember the Sabbath day, keeping it holy on a Saturday. They could. Yep. Others, others just decided to make it a Sunday because they didn't. They felt they had some flexibility. Um, yeah. Because you've got to remember that um, outside of um, Jewish culture, Saturday was not a day off. So if you're a Greek in Corinth and you become a Christian and you have an employer, or if you're a slave, you can't just decide to have Saturday off. Oh, so, yeah. so there's nothing they could do. And most Christians in this period were not rich. They were workers and poor. So there's yeah. just no way, as Christianity spread into non-Jewish culture, that you could just willy-nilly decide to have Saturday off. Yes, but thank yes, God yes, for yes, Emperor Constantine yes. at least gave us Sunday off. That is amazing. I didn't even know that, John. That is a really fascinating piece of history and uh, makes a lot of sense. And now I know why Sunday is the day that uh, that, we, that all the Christians started going to church. And uh, hey, Lindy, I want to thank you so much for calling in today. Uh, you're in Parks there. Go and say hello to Michael at the uh, the subway in Parks. He's actually a second cousin of mine. Give him a high five for me and tell him you're talking to Cousin Andrew. But thank you so much for joining the program today, Lindy. No worries. I know his wife and family. I'll say good day. What's your name? Andrew, Andrew McLennan. Andrew McLennan. Yeah, I know their family. Our kids have done M&D with their kids. Yeah, God bless. We really appreciate you calling in, Lindy, and you have a super day. The talk lines are still open as well. You may have a question just like, that was an amazing question, and it was actually an amazing answer, John. I've never heard that explained before, why Sunday became the day when Christians all went to church, and, you know, in a sort of a loose sort of a way, it became our Sabbath as well. So John is still here for about another 15 minutes. If you've got another call for him, call us on 1-800-316-316. That's 1-800-316-316. John, I want, to get, I want to get back to the undeceptions. What do you, from your observation, obviously we can't generalize everything, but what do you think one of the challenges are to Christianity today as far as the average Christian potentially going down a wrong path with deception? What, what's your observations on that? Um. 
I think it's, uh, well, there are a bunch of issues, mate. Um, I think around sex and sexuality, marriage and all those sorts of things, because we sort of lost that argument in public, um, I think the temptation for Christians is just to let go of that issue and, you know, not trust the Bible anymore because, you know, a majority of people think we're idiots. But I would just remind people that um, people have thought Christians were idiots from the beginning. You know, it's our specialty <laughs> being thought idiots. Um, but we need to be good losers. Um, and this, I think this is one of the one of the main things I want to convey to Christians here in America, but also in, in at back at home, that when you lose in public, like we, you know, we lost the whole marriage debate and so on, we, we lose the abortion debate, we lose the transgender debate, et cetera, et cetera. What it can do is produce in a Christian anger and resentment at culture. And so suddenly we start becoming harsh and angry instead of what our Lord taught us to be cheerful and rejoice when people say evil things against us. That's what he says in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and turn the other cheek and love our enemies and always speak with grace, always with gentleness and respect. So the temptation for Christians is either we give up these Christian ideas that aren't popular anymore. Yeah. That's a problem. Or we get angry with the world. And that's a huge problem because there's no way you can say to the world, God loves you and he came into the world in Jesus to die for you. At the same time, you're saying, you jerk, you horrible, insane person. You just can't do it. You can't convey the love of God in an angry tone. Yeah, I like that. So the potential for deception, sometimes we imagine it'll be like some great doctrine that we get sucked into that takes us astray. But I really like the way you've worded that, that if we just, like you said, have the wrong attitude towards unbelievers, towards the world, that's a deception, isn't it? Because like you said, because Jesus go back to the Gospels, he spent time with sinners. He was the friend of sinners. And some of these people were immoral, they were crooked, they were liars, they were thieves. Who knows what they were up to? And yet he loved them, didn't he? And he welcomed them into his kingdom, you know, obviously with his word, and there was going to be a transformation down the track, but he loved them. And that's a, that's a really good point. So when you say we lost the debate about sexuality, you mean that mainstream society has rejected traditional Christian yep. teaching on, on sexuality? Okay, yep. Yeah, yep. yeah. yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, what, what's another one? So that's sexuality and marriage. Is there another area that you feel like uh, potentially Christians can fall into error very easily these days? Getting too aligned to politics, left or right. Um, pinning our hopes on politics, I think, is a real problem. I mean, I see this in, a, in America in a major way. It's one of the most disorienting things about being in America now yep. is how many Christians have sort of tied their hopes for America to a political outcome. Um, when Christians have done fine without political power. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't, you know, try to have our best candidates. I'm not saying Christians shouldn't vote uh, Christianly. They absolutely should. Please don't mishear me. But but we mustn't pin our hopes on politi political outcomes or legislation because our kingdom is not of this world. Jesus is still at the right hand of God and the gospel is still powerful to save. And I really believe that we could lose every political uh, debate, every legislative debate, and every election, and the gospels still go gangbusters. Yeah, so what let's a, not pin our hopes on politics. Yeah, what a great message. I think I heard one American pastor put it like this. If you've got more hope and prayer in the second coming of Trump to the White House than the return of Jesus, you've gone off track. Because like you said, a lot of people pin their hopes on political leaders, either from you know one side or the other, that they're going to somehow bring in God's kingdom, which has never happened. But we've got another caller from, uh, from Jin Jin in Queensland. His name is John. John, have you got a question for Professor John? Uh, yes, just relating to that um, item before about uh, Sunday being the day for meeting Christians. I, I heard him say that uh, Emperor Constantine gave Sunday off and Christians were already meeting on Sunday. How did, what I didn't get was, I might have missed it, was how did Christians come to be meeting on the Sunday in the first place anyway? Oh, and thank you, John. Um, I should have made that clear. Um, they They met on the first day of the week early in the morning, it was a work day, first day of the week, 
to because every Sunday or every church service was a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. And yeah, the, the gospel is perfectly clear. Week, yeah. No, yeah. yeah, Jesus was raised on the first day of the week, which is a Sunday. But we have yeah. early evidence that in order to do this and everyone still get to work, Christians met before dawn for church. Wow. How about that? <laughs> Goodness, mate. Shocker. Okay. Now, I, I struggle that as well. <laughs> I, I tell you what, John, uh, he's a wealth of information, isn't he, our professor? John, now we've got a couple more callers, and we're going to try and rush through these before the program ends. But, John, from Jinjin in Queensland, I want to thank you so much for calling into 2020 today. And I'm going to quickly try and get another caller on here, John, before we have to wrap it up. And we have Andrea from New South Wales. Andrea, have you got a question for Professor John? Yeah, it's about these miracles, please. Can you please tell us a bit about um, how these miracles, what his understanding of these miracles are? You mean the miracles? Do you mean the miracles of Jesus? Yeah, the one on the water, the five thousand, and all this business. Yeah, you'd like you'd like a history professor to give his take on the miracles documented in the Bible, Professor John, about wine. uh, Sorry, water turning into wine and Jesus walking on the water. Have you got a comment there for Andrea? I've got many. I give a whole lecture on the healings of Jesus. Um, The cool thing is, even secular historians agree Jesus must have done things everyone thought at the time were miracles. And the reason even secular historians agree with this is because we have so many different lines of evidence. Even non-Christians refer to Jesus' miraculous powers. So there's too many lines of evidence for us to dismiss it. Even secular historians, like Paula Fredrickson from Boston University, who don't believe miracles are possible, think Jesus did things people thought at the time were miracles. She says, oh, I don't know what they were, but he did things that people thought were miracles. And I would just say, well, but if I believe in God, if I believe that God runs the rules of nature, the laws of nature, then the fact that God could turn water into wine, he could give sight to the blind, means that if I have good historical evidence that on one occasion he did, well, then my background belief that God runs the rules of nature, and my foreground history belief that there's excellent evidence Jesus did miracles come together in a perfect match. So I am a huge believer in all the miracles of the Gospels. Yeah, that is a great answer. And Andrew, I want to thank you so much for calling in. So we've run out of time and we can't take any more calls. And thank you for uh, to Richard from Alstonville who tried to call in as well. But we can't get your question today, Richard. I'm really sorry. We need to wrap it up. But John, I, I want to call you Professor one more time just to give you credit and respect. <laughs> Professor John Dixon, I want to thank you so much for joining us on 2020. It sounds like this was a nice little refreshing experience for you too, to hear all the Aussie accents. And I, um, I think we're going to have to get you back again in the future. But I want to just give a big plug now. You've got a website. It's johndixon.org. That is johndixon.org. On that website, you can find all of the links, all of the information, links to his books that he's written. He's written over 20 books. And this Undeceived podcast, I want to give that a big shout out. Look up his Undeceived podcast. It'll be on all the major podcast platforms. It sounds like a lot of work goes into it. Five staff in Sydney producing it, putting music to it, and just great content. And what I love about you, John, is that you know, you're know you the same young guy in the late 80s singing those songs about Jesus, trying to make the church relevant. You've got that same heart today to make all the information you've studied and all of the knowledge of the Bible and theology, you're still trying to connect it to the unsaved world. So I just want to commend you for that, for just running the race you've run up until now and staying so true to your call. And I just want to thank you so much for joining us on 2020 Today. Absolute joy, mate. Anytime. Bless you.